I need to make sure this is going. Okay, we are recording. Excellent. So again, good evening. Did I say good morning before? I apologize for the state of mind I am in, everybody. And that was just recorded too. So <laughs> for those of you who haven't joined us on our webinars before, uh, first off, I do normally talk like this. I am a little out of it right at the moment. But for those who also haven't joined webinar, uh, Zoom is the platform we'll be using. So uh, Zoom is going to allow me to share our screen like I'm doing now with the PowerPoint, but there's also a chat window available. Uh, we'll be trying to utilize the chat window for some discussions and uh, sharing about some sounds we'll be talking about tonight. So if you go to the top of your screen um, and select the exit full screen, the chat window should either be top left um, or bottom left, I believe. Occasionally it's on the bottom right. But in that chat window, just make sure you hit send to everyone. Um, that way, if you share any neat ideas or um, awesome comments, everybody can see those. If you do want to just talk to Kelly and myself for any um, outside questions or comments, feel free to hit all panelists. But in general, any questions you have, hit everyone because likely somebody else has a question that uh, they want to answer to. So let's test that chat window out. And if you can, please tell us where in the world you're coming from and what type of educator you are. Okay, West Virginia, Florida, North Carolina, several North Carolinas, quite a few different. Uh, New Jersey, looking at this, we seem to have a lot of informal educators, um, homeschool, non-traditional, instructional designer. Delaware. Kelly is from Delaware, so Emily, you just made her very happy. Oh, Joy, welcome, it's nice to see you. Good to see you, Ellen. Washington, Atlanta. Excellent. A lot of homeschool families represented too. This is wonderful. It looks like we have a, uh, a great group here with us. A lot of informal educators. So thank you guys for sharing that. That helps us give us perspective of where in the world you're coming from. Uh, just as a heads up, we are at Ithaca, New York at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We're somewhere in the middle of that building. Um, and it's starting to look this beautiful. If you're uh, one of our previous webinars, it was completely snowed in. We weren't sure if we were actually going to leave the building. Um, but it's springtime. The peepers are going. We have yellow rumped warblers. We have eastern towhees, eastern phoebes. I saw 12 snapping turtles today. It was a great day outside. So at the lab here in Ithaca, New York, we are a nonprofit membership-driven institution that's dedicated to interpreting and conserving the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. And specifically, Kelly and myself are with the Birds of K-12 program. And our mission is to create innovative resources and training opportunities that are building science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in the citizen science project. Again, my name is Lindsay Glasner. I'm the outreach coordinator. Kelly Schaefer is our education specialist. She'll be monitoring the chat window and correcting me if I make any errors during this webinar. So in the next hour, we are here to talk about bird communication. So you hopefully you'll come away with a better understanding of how birds communicate, why they communicate, distinguishing songs versus calls, but we'll also introduce you guys to some of the lessons and activities that we have available around bird communication and teaching bird sounds. So before we really begin, I want us to warm up our ears and we're gonna play a mystery sound game. Now, this is an activity that's in um, one of our paid curriculum kits, Most Wanted Birds, but I really like this activity when talking about bird communication because it challenges kids to start thinking about how do you describe sounds? How do you talk about sounds? So what we're going to do, I'm going to play six mystery sounds. 
And as you're listening to each mystery sound, if you want to challenge yourself, feel free to grab a pen and paper and write down words or how you would describe the sound you're hearing. After each mystery sound, we're going to reveal whether it's a bird or not. Um, so let's start off with our first mystery sound. Excellent. That was our first mystery sound. Again, if you want to really get into it, I recommend writing down some words, descriptive words for that sound. Our next one, mystery sound two. couple seconds to write down any notes. We're going to go into mystery sound three. I apologize, at the very beginning I accidentally double clicked. We're going to transition to four, which is what you briefly heard at the beginning of three. Okay, number And our last mystery sound, number six. Okay, so it's a really good thing our videos aren't on because Kelly and I are basically reenacting all of those sounds. Um, but what we're going to do is I'm going to move on to each sound. And in the chat window, I'd encourage you to share any descriptive words you provided or you thought about when you heard the sound. But then also, if you want to guess whether it's a bird or not, feel free to do so. And Laura, I appreciate the fact that it's not just adults or kids who can, humans that can enjoy the mystery sounds. Cats do too. My dog always looks at me funny when we do this. So back to our first mystery sound. I'm going to play it again. Feel free to put in descriptive words that you may think of or whether you think it's a bird or not. I see a bird alarm clock, continuing trilling, chirping frog, insect maybe, a long, long hope. Yeah. <laughs> I like that, Ellen. That brings up a really great idea. Instead, um, in, have kids listen to these sounds and challenge them to replicate the sounds. 
<laughs> annoying. Oh, sorry, Teresa. <laughs> but a lot of you are guessing frogs or insects, and you guys are spot on. This is American toad. A yelling frog at a soccer game. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm loving this, uh, the descriptions here. So let's pop those descriptions in for our second mystery sound. Here it is again. And again, the dance moves. Kelly and I hear that. And we also like just kind of go with the flow. And many of you guys were getting that flowy kind of feel because most of you are saying whale, deep, echoey. I love the Dory analogy because I first heard that and I thought Dory too. You guys are doing great. This is a bowhead whale. Absolutely. Okay, we are going off to... <laughs> <laughs> Kelly's laughing over here at that comment. I love your description. Karen. <laughs> okay, our third mystery sound. Barbara, I liked your first answer, crikey, better than cricket. Uh, chirping, insect-like, absolutely. I mean, this is a fairly common, common noise we often hear, field cricket, absolutely. Okay, so far of the three sounds, we haven't had any birds yet. Let's go to our fourth sound. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a bird. I don't know if my comments made a puppy whimpering. My puppy does kind of sound like that. A very happy loon. Yeah, Joy, this is a common loon. Kelly and I actually just saw these guys going through the mating display two days ago. Was it? Yeah. It was really cool. But yes, this is a common loon, but I like going through um, a happy uh, rep repetition of some sort whiny call. I had a friend go camping in the North Woods and who had never heard a loon before and thought somebody was being attacked. <laughs> so a murder of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go to our fourth sound. We can't trick you guys on this one. We didn't even get any kind of descriptive. We got one. Sad one descriptive. And lonely. Sad and lonely. Okay, so emotions happening. Oh, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Appreciate that one. Yes, you guys are all right. This is a wolf, and somebody, James, you had it right. This is a gray wolf. Well done. Okay, our last sound. I've only ever had one person get this right. Kelly's looking at me here, confused, saying, I don't even know what this is. Uh, Whippoorwill is a good uh, guess. Screech Owl, maybe. I'm liking the descriptions, Kathy. It's eerie, echoey, whooping, a uh, monkey of some kind, whining, Whippoorwill. It is. <clears throat> Monkeys was a good guess. It is a white-headed gibbon. Oh, and somebody asked how long, so this is an hour long, so what? This started at 6 p.m. Eastern time, this will go to 7 p.m. Eastern time. But I really do love this activity. One, not only engages you guys, but it's a great starting point to think about how do you describe sounds. Um, starting off with a basic mindset of many of you guys were denoting uh, or uh, putting emotions to the sounds, this is sad, lonely, or actions to these. Could it be courtship? Could it be uh, murdering something? Um, I've heard dying cow before. I've heard for the white-headed gibbon, it almost sounds like, hey girl, whoop, woo, come on over here, like trying to attract meat. 
but it's really good to focus on just the starting point of how do you describe what you're listening to and also why might these animals be making these noises so of our six mystery sounds we only had one bird the common loon but it helped start to think about well why do animals vocalize and specifically why do birds vocalize so birds don't just sing or call because it sounds pretty. Oftentimes there are other means. Uh, vocalizations are the main mode of communication for many birds. Um, they might sound like a foreign language to us and we can't understand it, but they are sending different messages. Uh, not just the same species of birds, but to other species as well. They do recognize um, what different what uh, different calls and sounds mean between different bird species. So we do an activity with children, and this is part of our bird communication lesson that's uh, for mostly the elementary age group. But we ask kids, let's create a diagram of, or brainstorm ideas and list why birds sing or call. And when they develop this list, they come up with some really fun things like potentially very accurate things. They wanna get a mate or they're hungry like begging calls. Uh, but there are some also interesting ones like to annoy humans um, because they're lonely, they wanna clear their throats. So it's really interesting to start trying to brainstorm with children, why do birds sing or call? And then we can go just like, uh, birds calls and songs, they have so many different vocalizations, we can then start to uh, categorize each of these different um, songs and calls. And the big difference we're gonna look at is what is a song versus what is a call. So the terms bird song and bird call are often used interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. The difference is in their function for the birds. So the term song is going to refer to vocalizations that birds use to attract a mate or to defend a territory. Um, songs can tend to be longer or more complex than calls in general, uh, but birds will actually use the calls for a variety of other reasons, such as communicating their location of food, keeping track of each other, even to sound an alarm. So I want to go in depth and break down the different types of songs and calls that we may have. Now, attracting mates is one of the most important functions of bird songs. Typically, it's the male who sings to attract the female, and the male usually sings very early in the morning. Uh, dawn chorus is our typical understanding of you wake up to the dawn chorus of all these males singing. And it's an important clue to the female bird who is looking for a potential mate. So if the male bird has enough energy to sing long, loud, sometimes complicated songs uh, first thing in the morning before he's had any food at all. And if he can do it for a long time, he must be a strong and healthy potential mate. And oftentimes they're gonna check out, well, where's his territory too? And that's going to attract female birds. They might be looking for, okay, if this guy is strong and healthy, then he'll have strong and healthy uh, young too. Now, when you hear such sounds as say this, Absolutely, April, that's a blackbird. And specifically, that is a male red-winged blackbird saying, conqueree, conqueree. Um, I pardon my, my singing voice, not as great as that blackbird. But it's a very classic sound that you can hear over the entire continent. And it's all about males who are defending territory. So these are territorial songs. Um, and that one second song starts with the abrupt note, but it turns into that musical green trill. Um, what I really like about the red winged blackbirds is the males make themselves very visible, typically standing up at the top of a cattail or a shrub in the wetlands, and they'll completely stand up tall, lean over, fluff out their feathers, 
you really need to get a video on the two of us. We're both standing over with our arms out, with our feathers fluffed out here, um, tail pressed out, fanned out, and really standing out, looking bold to defend his territory. Um, during the breeding season, many birds find and defend breeding territories. Now, breeding territories are carefully chosen and fiercely guarded. Uh, once a male red-winged blackbird has claimed a breeding territory, uh, birds typically live completely within that territory during the duration of the breeding season. So a, brood, a good breeding territory has to have a good nest site, abundant food resources for raising young, the males seeing constantly to let other birds know that that's their territory, it's been claimed, and so everybody else better stay out. Now, the red-winged blackbirds are very common across North America, and they're especially known for their territorial displays. If you're interested at all in these guys, we do have a free download, um, Evolution in Paradise, which actually goes through uh, the behavioral territorial displays of rubbing blackbirds, now that I think about that. Um, <clears throat> another fairly common and notoriously territorial bird is a northern cardinal. For those of you on the east coast, you guys are probably familiar with this bird. Um, though these two photos may look very different, uh, they are in fact the same species. On the left, we have a female, and on the right, we have a male. Now, usually male birds tend to be more aggressive defending their territory than female birds. But when it comes to cardinals, the females are just as territorial and fierce as their male counterparts. Uh, both the male and female northern cardinals also sing. So females sing from the nest while they're incubating and brooding. And it's generally in response to nearby males' chip calls. <clears throat> uh, essentially, these songs of females appear to provide information to her mate about the need for food. This information um, allows her visually conspicuous mate to restrict his visits essentially to avoid having any kind of predators that may be drawn to the nest as well. So looking at songs, we are really focusing on attracting mates and defending territories. Transitioning to calls, again, these are gonna be simpler um, and not gonna be for mates or territories. Instead, you might be looking and hearing calls such as this one. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure if we could see a raise of hands, everybody has heard that call before. Uh, those are the flight calls of Canada geese. Now, flight is just one of the means that birds can um, communicate during their calls. It's thought to help birds keep in contact with one another. They can also serve as sort of an air traffic control for the birds by helping them avoid collisions with one another. The calls are most often heard uh, in large flocks, potentially during migration season, uh, and they're often for birds who travel long distances. However, this is the prime time right now where we're going to start having some migration come through over the next month. If you by chance have a nice quiet night outside, just go out and listen. Uh, you might be hearing a lot of different uh, night flight calls because a lot of birds do migrate during the nighttime. Uh, flight calls, they aren't the only calls that birds use to keep safe. Many birds have alarm calls, and that means that there's a threat or a predator nearby. Some birds, like jays, actually use a different call for flying predators than they do for predators that stay on the ground. Uh, and oftentimes birds, even though they're of different species, can recognize other birds' alarm calls. And this causes a variety of bird species to come together, flock together, and essentially mob a predator. A very common example, uh, jays or chickadees will do common alarm calls. The next thing you know, it's something like, this is Eastern Screech Owl, Kelly, right? Okay, I don't, I don't often see the red morph. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Um, this Eastern Screech Owl, if he was just hanging out outside, uh, or a chickadee notice uh, that chickadee, she might be doing that chickadee dee 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 dee. 
It's alarm call. And that might attract some tit mice. It might attract jays. It might attract crows. It could attract a whole diversity of birds. And that's called a mobbing behavior. From alarm calls, we can also look at begging calls. Most baby birds do rely on their parents for food early on in life. Some even still require help from their parents to find food after they've left the nest. So young birds that have already left the nest but are still uh, somewhat reliant on their parents, we call those fledglings. Uh, this chickadee here in the photo is a fledgling and it's making a begging call to uh, one of its parents to say, come feed me, come feed me, I'm hungry. And begging calls really do work. Uh, they're quite effective. So there are birds like these northern gannets here that do nest in colonies, which may seem, okay, if all these uh, gannet young are begging, how do the parents differentiate? The begging calls uh, actually help the parents differentiate which chick is theirs. So they can identify their own chick's um, identity by their begging call. They can isolate that. So colonies as well, having those begging calls is actually very important for those colonial species. Some birds call to tell other birds that they found food. You might be thinking, why would they want to do that? Why wouldn't they just want to keep all the food to themselves? It's not always the case. In fact, some birds helping each other out actually increases each individual bird's chances of finding food. So especially with predation, having a swarm of swallows together, they're not only gonna have more eyes to watch out for predators, but there's a decreased chance that the bird um, will be found and eaten, captured and eaten by a predator. These cliff swallows in this picture, um, these birds will swoop through the air to feed on flying insects. It can be difficult for just one swallow to keep track of a whole swarm of insects. So having an entire flock together um, will actually be advantageous for all the swallows. Um, they'll all benefit because they all get some kind of food source in the long run. So we just went through a whole basic background of songs versus calls. Are there any questions on the difference between songs versus calls? Okay. Feel free to type any questions if you do have them in the chat window. Kelly will notify me or answer them herself. Oftentimes the question that we get is, how do these birds know their songs and calls? And different birds have different songs and repertoire. So some birds um, might not use all the vocalizations that we just went through, whereas some birds may use all of those and then some. Uh, but ultimately how they know their calls is uh, based off of this cladogram. Uh, cladogram being the evolutionary relationship between organisms. The Passeriformes is, is the perching birds category. These are all the are perching birds or songbirds. And it breaks up into two categories. The um, Ossines, which are the true songbirds, and the sub -Ossines. Now, not included in the perching birds category, like duck, geese, chickens, turkeys, etc. cetera. Um, when we're looking at our two categories of the Ossines and the sub -Ossines, the sub these are mostly the tropical species and some fly catchers. These are birds that innately are born with the ability to sing, whereas the true songbirds, uh, which are gonna be the majority of our perching birds here, these are birds where they actually have to learn how to sing. Now, of the true songbirds, these are the Ossines. They have complex songs, and they're actually going to need to learn to practice how to sing their song. Uh, there is a very sensitive period when the bird is between 15 to 20 days old, and it's during this period that the birds are able to memorize the details of their parents' song. And so they learn the song, but not only learn it, they, they do practice it. 
it's always fun in the spring and summertime listening to Jays practice different calls or or what have you. I, I enjoy listening to Jays try and practice a red tailed hawk, which is always good. But then again, so those are going to be our true songbirds. We then also have the Aussies. These are going to be birds uh, that innately know sub -Aussians. thank you. Um, these are sub Aussians who know how to innately sing. Um, it's encoded within their genes. Like this uh, willow flycatcher, they're born with the knowledge of how to sing their song. That does bring up the question of birds like this. Does anybody recognize um, either of these birds? Yes, Karen, that is a Wilson's warbler on the right. How about the bird on the left? Does anybody recognize that bird? I'll give you a hint. It's a fledgling. A fledgling of a bird. Cowbird. Yeah, Ellen, that's exactly what it is. It is a cowbird, a brown-headed cowbird. Now, for those of you who don't know brown-headed cowbirds, these guys are nest parasites, which means they lay their eggs in the nest of other birds. So the mama bird kind of scopes out, you know, this Wilson warbler looks like a very dedicated mom. She has a nice nest. I'm going to scope it out. When the mom leaves, I'm going to the nest. The female brown-headed cowbird, in less than 10 seconds, she'll lay her egg and then get out of there. The Wilson's warbler here will uh, raise that brown-headed cowbird egg just like its own. As you can see here, it's feeding the fledgling. That brown-headed cowbird was putting out begging calls and it's getting fed. But this asks the question of how do nest parasites like this brown-headed cowbird know their own species vocalization? Um, this question has been one that's been put out through the ornological field quite a few times. One study done by Meredith West and her colleagues uh, shows that before a young group of cowbirds, uh, or sorry, basically the study shown that it's not actually hardwired for the cowbirds. Instead, they took a very young group of brown-headed cowbirds and had them socialize with a group of canaries during their first winter. And in the springtime, she let the cowbirds loose in this aviary with a mixed group of birds. And what happened was those cowbirds that had been growing up with the canaries actually sang like canaries and they tried to court with canaries. So the brown-headed cowbirds grew up learning and practicing the canary songs. Now, of course, the um, cowbirds were not necessarily successful that mating season. The canaries just basically ignored them. But the next season, the Meredith West and her colleagues then took the cowbirds and had them stay with other cowbirds. That following spring again, the cowbirds behaved like normal cowbirds. They sing like cowbirds, they made cowbird moves, did a little mating routine, and you guys know what happens next. So with that, the cowbirds actually showed that they had to learn how to behave like cowbirds. It doesn't just come naturally to them. So this adds or provides us one other bit of evidence into how nest parasites know their own species and vocalizations. So we've seen that birds can have pretty extraordinary vocal capabilities. Um, whether the songs just come in neat or they have to learn and practice their songs. But oftentimes we ask, okay, I'm listening to a wood thrush in the woods. How the heck do those wood thrushes make such a beautiful noise? Now, we as humans, we have a larynx or our voice box, and that allows us as humans to vocalize. Essentially, birds just have a, a more advanced larynx called a syrinx, and that's a double form here on the right. So I'm going to do a quick, very short video around the syrinx. The song of the viri is a haunting, two-toned, descending spiral. How does it do that? Birds can make such complicated sounds because of the unique structure of their instrument.
We humans push air from our lungs through a vocal box called a larynx that vibrates making a single sound. We adjust pitch and tone both at the larynx and by the shape of the mouth. Birds have a similar structure but it's doubled. The syrinx of a songbird has two membranes allowing it to make separate sounds at the same time. Every species has its different physical variation that helps it make its song. So that was actually just a very short uh, one minute clip out of a longer uh, 10 minute video called The Language of Birds. I do recommend that video. It's a great introductory on that bird communication. Kelly will share the link to that video in the chat window. But we've covered a lot of content around the logistics of bird vocalization. And it's important when we work with students to not only just introduce that, but to make sure they're actually hearing sound. Uh, a very basic activity that I love starting with um, is having kids go outside and work on their quiet observational skills. One activity we do is called a sound map. Now with a sound map, uh, I'll have the kids have a sheet of paper. If they have a nature journal, have them take a nature journal out. And in the center, they're just gonna write or draw an X. Now, when they go outside, have them find some space around where they can sit down. And then from there, you just first have them close their eyes and just listen. And whether it's an urban environment, a suburban, a, a very rural environment, it doesn't matter. Just have the kids close their eyes and listen. And after a little bit, then have them start to actually open their eyes and identify what are the sounds that they're hearing and where are those sounds coming from? Now, on the picture on the right here, you can see the student actually was drawing images, um, an airplane flying over the direction the airplane was going, somebody talking, um, a bark from a car, a dog, some cars, looks like some music happening over here. But the point of this activity is to first recognize the kids that there are sounds happening nonstop. Um, oftentimes we go through life, even just walking down the street and have adapted to just block out the sound, the background noise, whether it be natural or man-made. And so this activity is working with the kids to start opening up their ears and letting in all sounds again. Now, once they can start hearing the sounds around them and noticing those sounds, they wanna to start to be able to describe those sounds. You could do a very similar activity to how we started with the mystery sounds. I enjoy doing that activity when it's a little more in depth. I actually give you time on how to describe those mystery sounds. Another way is you can introduce the concept of mnemonics. Now, a mnemonic device, uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, is a way for us to help remember something. We hear a sound and we put words to those sounds to help us remember it. Bird watchers often memorize bird sounds by thinking of them in terms of human words. For example, the chirping of a Carolina wren sounds like tea kettle. So what I wanna do is test out some of these. I'm gonna play the three different sounds. Let me, okay, I'm gonna play two different sounds. I can't actually reach the top one, it's covered. Um, it's covered on mine. So um, I'm gonna play two different sounds and I want you guys to listen to it. Think what kind of uh, mnemonic you'd place that word and see if you can match it up with the image here on the screen. There it is. And I'll play that for you one more time. We have some guesses of a white-throated sparrow. That's correct, Ellen. 
Did you guys hear when it goes, oh, sweet, Canada, 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 Canada? I'll play that again. Look, the white-throated sparrow, mnemonic, oh, sweet, Canada, Canada. We can play that again for you. Okay, I'm going to play you another sound. Again, the mnemonic is pictured here on the left. So this one is a lot more difficult, um, it's more challenging of these. Anybody have any ideas? Okay, I'm seeing red-eyed vireo, red-eyed vireo, chestnut-sided warbler, red-eyed vireo, red-eyed vireo. Yes, this is a red-eyed vireo. Um, this is one that I personally have struggled with for a little bit, but the way it's how it's been described to me is asking, where are you? I am here. It's asking a question, answering a question. Asking a question, answering a question. So I'm gonna play it again real quick and see if you guys can hear it. Um, for those who said chestnut sided warbler, can you you can do a chestnut sided warbler mimic? No, I can't. You can't? Please, please, please to meet you. Yeah, that's what it kind of sounds like, mnemonic. Yeah. Please, please, please to meet you. I recommend for those of you who have a smartphone, go to the Merlin Bird ID app. You can actually search any birds in there and they have a whole series of songs and calls. Or you can just go to our All About Birds website and they have a whole series of calls too. Oftentimes they will actually put down any mnemonics if they're very common mnemonics. Um, my personal favorite is Eastern Toey going, drink your tea. But thank you. That's, that's actually the first sound that I couldn't play. I was very disappointed. Yeah, can you play the chestnut side of Warbler? Sure. Let's see if this will work. Okay. So again, these, um, I recommend looking through the mnemonics aspect. We got these uh, image from the Bird and Moon comics. So this is of the Eastern bird. They also have a Western bird as well. So Kelly shared both of those or will share both of those in the chat window. Now we've gone through, okay, let's first um, work with kids on how to just open their ears to sound. Then let's start working on describing sounds. Now we can start working on visualizing sound. And visualizing sound is basically the next step when it comes to teaching bird vocalizations. Now to visualize sound, we use spectrograms. These are three dimensions of sound to be aware of when examining the spectrogram, and that's pitch, volume, and duration. Now the sounds shown on the spectrograms here demonstrate how to interpret a spectrogram. So, Let's look first here. This is going to be the pitch. So you'll see a pitch. Um, it's a basically frequency. The higher the pitch, the higher it will show up on our spectrogram. Next, we have volume. This is the amplitude. So the brighter colors indicate a louder sound. And then our final one is duration. And you'll see the duration is represented here on the bottom. Now, of course, these sounds were made by a computer. So if I was trying to replicate pitch, volume, or duration with my own voice, it won't be so nice and clean. 
but looking at spectrograms of bird calls or bird songs is a great opportunity to not only listen to the call, but then be able to see it and help with the memory. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna play a fun game called Bird Song Hero. And we're gonna do it very short, but here is our game Bird Song Hero. Kelly in the chat window just shared the Bird Song Hero game. It's on our Bird Academy website. But essentially the background is, is this is going to play a song. And that song is going to match up with one of these three spectrograms. Now, for those bird nerds out there, it's challenging to not focus on, oh, I recognize, I know that sound is a, a Carolina chickadee or what have you, but to really focus on listening to the mystery sound and then visualizing how that spectrogram would look. So, here is our first sound. Now, I'm gonna play it again, and in the chat window, if you can type in A, B, or C of which spectrogram you think it is. I'm seeing a lot of Bs, so let's go with B. Excellent, good job everyone. So let's just give a quick, here's A. And then here's C. Okay, let's go to the next question. Here's our mystery sound. Go play it again. One more time. It looks like we have a mix C. Seems to be the conclusion. Let's try C. Well done, everyone. That's our correct answer. We can play that again. Here is B. Here's A. That was the Eastern Toey. Drink your tea. Love that Toey. Okay, we're gonna do one more sound. Here's our mystery noise. That's a short one, let's see. Looks like a lot of A's are coming in. Let's try A. Ooh, good job, you guys are good at this. Let's try Nate, or B. And then C. That's such a cool sound. Oh, wait, I'm going to test you guys real quick. Let's see. We can go, and you can have a round two. This is Bird Song Ultimate. So this is the challenging one. Let's try one ultimate song and test your knowledge. Okay, here's our mystery sound. Play it again. One more time. Okay. I'm seeing A's here. Let's try A. Now I'm really curious, like are you guys just bird nerds and know that by heart or are you really that good at reading spectrograms? This is great. A is our correct answer. That was a black BB. Out of curiosity, here's our black rosy finch. And then here is our indigo bunting. Hmm, a lot faster. So this is bird song here, and it goes through a whole series of questions where you're really trying to focus on visualizing the spectrogram um, based on the sound you're hearing and picking the right choice. Um, I personally love bird song here; it keeps me tested. But one way that you can do this is you can go through. Uh, Macaulay Library, and Macaulay Library is the largest multimedia library in the world. We have over 175,000 animal sounds, which includes up to 70% of the world's bird species, and that's growing every day. 
But the nice thing about this enormous database is that these are recordings from all around the world. So you might come across a brand new recording that was just recorded yesterday, uh, or a recording that dates back into the 1900s. It can be birds, insects, fish, frogs, mammals. But you as an educator, you have complete access to this entire database. So you can download any of these sounds that you want. I do warn you, it looks a little intimidating at first. They're revising their um, request for media. So it might seem like you're trying to purchase sounds, but you just list there that it's for an educational purpose and you have access to all those sounds. Now, if you want to truly download the sound files instead of just playing them off your computer, it does take um, a few days for the process of requesting the actual media files. So if you are looking to do a sound unit in advance, um, do a little preparation in advance if you want the actual sound file. But the nice thing is if you do get these sound files, we have an amazing program called Raven Light. Um, this just went through a new update. It's now Raven Light 2.0, but it's a full software program to uh, go through sound analysis. I love this program because I like be able to challenge myself and the people I work with to listen to a sound and try and mimic the sound. So I can um, go through spectrograms as well as waveforms of uploading any kind of audio recording in there, see the spectrogram for that audio recording, and then trying to use a microphone and mimic that recording myself and do live sound analysis. Uh, this is a truly marvelous program. So if you have more questions or um, want more information around that, uh, please let us know and I'll be happy to share those with you. The final resource I recommend, especially for those of you guys who uh, are in the elementary age group, Raven can be, the Raven Light, this program, um, you can use it at any age group, especially if you're up into the middle school or high school, being able to challenge them and understand the physics of sound, I think is really valuable. But for the elementary age group, really working on why birds communicate um, and introduction of uh, observational listening skills, bird communication is a great download. It's just a free download on our website. With that, uh, I am done. So we will take any questions you guys may have. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to see receive a letter of completion or participation for doing this, please send us an email, birdsluth at cornell.edu. I can send you a, a letter of completion for participating in this. If you're interested in all and any of these resources, feel free to download them in the link that Kelly provided. This webinar was recorded, so we'll make the recording available probably Friday morning. And with that, we will take any questions.